The Grand Poubette. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to act as the rapporteur for this session, which is dealing with the issues um, on treatment as prevention in the most at risk populations. Now, it's clear from the presentations this morning that we're not talking about a single population or a single community. Nevertheless, there are a number of commonalities and themes that run through every presentation, and uh, we've heard from all the speakers about systemic barriers such as institutionalization, colonization in our Aboriginal communities, um, internal um, stigma uh, that uh, gets externalized, um, and discrimination, homophobia. All of these, I argue, we have created in our society. They are systemic and they have taken um, generations um, to uh, permeate into these communities. And so um, uh, Kate Shannon presented a model on the risk environment, which um, is a model that was put forward by Tim Rhodes um, several years ago, and I think it's very helpful to be thinking about um, the risk environment in this framework because um, all of these conditions um, really are um, driven by um, the injustices that we have placed on, on these populations. And, and if we op often are putting the onus on the individual and blaming them for being bad drug users, bad sex workers, bad gay men, for not taking their medications, then it, it's, it's just perpetuating the same old marginalization and discrimination that they already feel. So what we're seeing when we hear about these things such as the residential school system that led to intergenerational trauma among Aboriginal peoples. We can't change this overnight. We as a society need to be able to sit down, even with our tribal leaders, and, and listen to what their issues are, even if we don't totally understand them, and try to engage them in a meaningful way to create structural interventions. Now, just as we um, tried to deliver ARVs to Sub-Saharan Africa overnight to roll out um, uh, and get you know our three by five initiatives um, in place. It, we had to build a global workforce to do that, and we couldn't do that overnight. We need to be able to look at these populations and the problems that they're experiencing, and take a long-term view. But that doesn't mean that we can't expect to see some change now. And so I think we need to do treatment as treatment better, so that we can do treatment as prevention better. Um, and in, in the short term, we, we can um, gather data from settings where we have um, very good cohort and surveillance data, such as here in Vancouver or Seattle or um, you know, uh, many of our European countries which have centralized registries, and to do some very careful mathematical modeling to be able to find out what are the coverage levels needed for various interventions, combination interventions, treatment as prevention being one of them, to, f to find out what level of herd immunity do we need in a community to make a difference. Because while we're trying to create structural interventions to make a difference in these most vulnerable communities, we can protect them with, our, with the herd immunity that we are providing in the entire population. And that might sound grandiose, but I believe that from a human rights perspective, we have the responsibility as a society because we created all of these systematic barriers for these people. So it is our responsibility as a society to remove them. So what kind of models work? What kind of models can we think about that have worked either on a micro or a macro level? Uh, I think there's some excellent examples, um, and, and we've, we've heard uh, from, from some of the speakers this morning who didn't have a chance to tell us about them. For example, Rick Altice has been uh, involved with a mobile clinic um, in his work um, at Yale University, a mobile methadone clinic where it's one-stop shopping, where people can come and they can get any multiple number of treatment regimens, but they also have a hand attached to those medications to bring those people into care, somebody who listens to them, someone who they trust. We know here in Vancouver that the Safer Injection Facility, Insight, is a place where drug users can go. They can um, not feel that they're decriminalized. There's a nurse there who can help them. It, 
it has been shown systematically that this safer injection facility has been able to increase rates of, of drug abuse treatment and for HIV positive uh, drug users it can bring them into care. So these are excellent models. Um, there are many, many others. We've heard uh, from others um, as well in the audience. Um, the Amsterdam model that has a circulating um, system that uh, has outposts and, and mobile units out in the community um, is, is yet another. But I think in terms of thinking about theoretical models, um, and we as researchers in the room um, need to think about them and, and address them, that community-based participatory research is a very important model for us to think about um, because it, it, it means that we sit down with communities and we actually listen to what they're saying and we try to understand and we engage and we find out what are their, their questions, what are their problems, and we tried to build those into our research. And I know that um, Dr. Shannon has been doing this with female sex workers here in Vancouver. She works with an NGO, uh, the Wish uh, Foundation. She works with PACE. These are not just um, people who are sitting on a community advisory board as token uh, members of a research project. They are actually partners. They are investigators on her research study. This is how we create change. This is how we create buy-in from the community. And I think it's absolutely critical that we do it. Um, we also need to take into account some of the cultural considerations and um, some of the uh, spiritual aspects, for example, in our ab Aboriginal community to be able to understand what their needs are. So I think with that, um, I, um, I would like to um, close, but I agree with one of the um, uh, people in the audience who suggested that from uh, these data, we should be able to uh, argue with, with data to create um, cost effectiveness and, and um, cost per infection averted uh, data that is going to make a difference to the policymakers. Because sometimes for people like me that are working with the marginalized populations here, that's just a drug user, you know? That person doesn't vote. They really don't matter is what that means. But when you can argue with data and you can say this person, even though they don't matter to you um, from a moral standpoint, they are going to, if, if you don't pay for this infection now, you're going to pay later. That is a very powerful uh, perspective. And those um, individuals who know how to do these cost effectiveness analyses, they can change the perspective, whether it's the payer perspective or the community perspective. And I think depending on who we're talking to, we need to be able to take those into account. So with that, um, I want to thank all of the speakers. I think that there was a lot of, uh, of commonalities. And, and really what we're hearing is that, that many of these um, um, conditions that they're, that they're facing uh, create syndemics. And syndemics are overlapping epidemics that have the same root causes. So I would argue that if we are going to con consider these as epidemics, whether it's syphilis or HIV or drug addiction or poverty, um, that we we, we look at them very carefully and we try to, uh, if we remove some of the underlying antecedents that are driving these syndemics, we are going to have an impact on multiple disease outcomes and that ultimately saves money. Thank you very much.